All right, I'm back with another video. Uh, this time I'm branching out a little bit. I'm going to do an analysis of a Western art classical type work. I'm a contemporary and jazz guy, but I thought I'd give it a go. You can always write in the comments if I've made mistakes. Uh, so what are we looking at? We are looking at Amy Beach's uh, Gaelic Symphony from 1894. We're looking at the first movement. This is from Unit 3, looking at the theme of identities. Uh, we're going to start with a guy called Dvorak. Uh, Dvorak was a big name at the time, and he encouraged composers to write uh, tunes that came from um, their tradition. So if you're Scottish, you should use Scottish folk tunes. If you're Australian, you should use Australian folk tunes. If you're American, you should use African-American melodies. Uh, so Amy Beach sort of took this on board. Uh, she was born in America. Uh, she was um, grew up in Boston, where there was a really strong Irish community. Uh, and so she seems to have used that Irish influence uh, to write her songs. She's not Irish per se herself, uh, but she's used that Irish sort of identity. Um, this little quote that I found from um, these guys, I think is worth trying to memorize. It's really helpful in answering any questions about identity. So um, Amy Beach composed a sympathetic narrative so a music that's a um, sympathetic story about, as she puts it, Irish Americans, their common joys, sorrows, adventures and struggles, and how they suffered both in Ireland and on their way over and settling. Uh, so the first movement imagines a dangerous sea crossing um, that the Irish endured to get to North America. Um, and you see that, I guess, in the six, eight meter, that kind of rolling feeling, the chromatics in the introduction, the dramatic sort of dynamics, the dramatic sound, um, you know, the dissonance, uh, the folk melodies. Uh, so I think it's worth sort of trying to memorize that quote or something like that. Oh, what about, I've gone too far. No, I haven't. Uh, so getting onto some more specific details, uh, this poem was written by William Ernest Henley. Uh, that inspires Amy Beach to write uh, this song, which is a piano and vocal piece. Uh, and then this song um, really is the foundation of the symphony. Uh, Amy Beach takes melodies from this Dark is the Night song that she wrote and turns that into the symphony. Uh, if you haven't listened to it, I reckon now is a good time to have a listen to the song before I go into some more in-depth analysis. Uh, so just the first movement uh, and get on with it. Uh, here we go, more detail for you nerds. Uh, here we go, let's do some translations and transpositions. So we've got here, flute, that's oboe. We've got clarinet in A. So you can see here, this is in E minor. And over here, we're in G minor. Uh, so hopefully you can sort of work out that transposition. That means a clarinet um, plays a C, but you hear an A uh, and you might be tempted to try and like transpose every note. So this has got to go down a third. Uh, but I actually think it's better to think of scale degrees. So you would just think, oh, that's the fourth of the scale. And then this is the first. And that kind of helps you work stuff out a little bit quicker, I think. Uh, don't have to do it that way, but that's how I would do it. Uh, what have we got here? We've got horn in F, which is a French horn. Uh, trombone. <laughs> that's not trombone. Trombe means trumpet in F. Trumpet is usually in B flat, uh, but for this score, it's trumpet in F. Uh, then we have trombone and then tuba. Oh, we probably should mention that. So this is a C clef, which means that this line here is a C, uh, and it's called a tenor clef, or tenor position might be a better way of saying it. Uh, this is fairly obvious. We've got violin one, violin two, viola. Uh, this is a C clef. That means that line there is a C. And this is an alto position, or sometimes called an alto clef. Uh, and we've got a cello, and we've got the basses. Uh, and then, what else? Uh, oh, we've got some timpanis here. Uh, so the triangle player gets the day off until the second movement, I believe. All right, that's kind of that stuff. Let's jump into some form. Uh, so the symphony, the Gaelic symphony, is in sonata form. So. If we were just to get rid of this and this for a second, and this, uh, then these three parts, the exposition, development, and recapitulation, is sonata form. And each of these, so the exposition, will play the first subject 
and the second subject. And then development will play the first subject and then the second subject, or develop it. And then we'll restate the first subject and that. Uh, but if we get rid of all that, then we just got these little sort of extra bits. So we have an introduction, a coda, and then in the exposition and the recapitulation, we have like an extra little melody that I'm calling a closing thing. Because in sonata form, you're really only supposed to have first and second uh, subject, not third subject. So uh, yes, we'll get more into that as we go along. Themes and motifs. Here we go. So uh, we start uh, with this sort of chromatic theme in E minor. Uh, what does it sound like? Like this. Yeah, pretty good. Uh, nothing to say about that. It just sort of goes all the way through the song. Oh, what have I done here? Oh, here it is. Here is that chromatic theme right at the start. Okay, then a bit confusingly, we have a rhythmic motif, which is really similar to the first subject. Uh, so uh, this, this particular bit here and this particular bit here is played all the way through the whole piece through everything. And the reason it's probably a rhythmic motif and not the first subject is because when you when you immediately play it it's kind of um, developed straight away uh, so where am I so you can hear it's first stated up here that rhythmic motif after this sort of chromatic intro uh, and then this is the next page uh, he says confidently uh, the next page it's immediately um, develop sort of here. You can see it happens here again and then it sort of happens here again. Uh, so it's not really the main subject or the first subject uh, that's stated a little bit later. So we're calling it a rhythmic motif, or I'm calling it that anyway. So on to the actual start of the form, which is the exposition. It starts around here at around letter A and you can see here is the actual start of the melody. So if you're just trying to find it, that's where you would find it. And then let's have a look at these actual melodies. So I've sort of written them out here. So we've got the first subject, number one, number two, and this is my closing thing. Uh, so if we sort of just tried to focus on this first one, uh, what have we got here? We've got some intervals. We've got a fourth, then we've got a minor third, and then we've got another fourth, and then here we've got a descending minor triad uh, in the key of E minor. So what does it sound like? It's pretty good for playing it upside down and backwards. Uh, I guess you could also think about it in scale degrees. I guess you've got a 5-1 here and it ends on the same that it starts on, sort of ends on the fifth there. Um, so yeah, a couple of ways to think about that. It's one phrase, it uses intervals. Uh, so that would be the first theme or for the first subject. Uh, what if I press this button? What happens? Do I go to the next one? Woohoo, here we got the second subject. Uh, this is in the key of G major, uh, or the relative major, sorry, I should say. It's got an octave here, another octave here, and I would argue it doesn't really resolve over here properly as such. Part of the appeal of the melody. So it kind of sounds like this. Oh, geez, where am I? And it kind of sounds like it wants to end going. Uh, but it never actually ends on that last note. It doesn't, doesn't end, it should sort of end on the tonic here, but the appeal of the melody is it doesn't quite finish there. Uh, it's the phrase length overall is a similar length to the one we've just heard. Uh, yeah, okay, that's the second theme. Go forward. Okay, and then uh, at the end of the exposition, I mean, we've got this little finishing theme, which is going to be very hard to play at this angle. It sounds a bit like an Irish folk tune. Oh, that last bit actually has got a nice little chromatic bit in the left hand. I should do that. Uh, something like that. All right, and that just happens at the end. I'm calling it the closing thingy because I don't know what we, what we should call it. 
put in the comments if you think there's a better name for it. Moving on to the development. So the development is starting here, which is page 26. You can see here, because remember I said we went from the, rel the minor to the relative major. Uh, so that's the G major chord there. And then we sort of descend back into the development, which is on E minor. And you can see that chromatic theme, the introductory theme comes back in again. Uh, so that's where the development starts. And then the main way I would argue that it's developed throughout is through a series of pedal points. Obviously a lot of pedal points and a lot of complicated things, but in general it's doing pedal points. So uh, if we had a quick look here, you can see that the B flat is played through here for quite a long way. We pedal usually on the dominant or on the fifth. So even though we've got a B flat in the bass here, we're actually in the key of E flat minor. Uh, so similarly, in the development, as we move forward, here we've got a pedal point in the key of C minor. The fifth of C is G. And you can see down here in the bass, we've got these Gs coming through and we're pedaling through uh, this stuff. Oh, a little augmentation there of, of a different melody. Uh, and then towards the end of the development, we have the Omega pedal in E minor. Again, the fifth is a B, so we've got Bs here. And this goes for a really long time, really building the tension and building a big um, pedal point tension point. So I think that's the main way things are developed through the development. The actual melodies aren't actually changed a lot through that um, development, which is a little unusual, but that's just how it is. You may be able to find some ways the melodies are changed, but I couldn't really find some. Uh, let's move on. What's next? Oh, back to the recapitulation. Well, I shouldn't say back to the recapitulation, should I? It's the first time we've got there. Let me find what page number we're at here so you can find it for yourself. Uh, recapitulation is on page 47 of the score if you wanted to look for it yourself. And interestingly, uh, what happens is we go from the same uh, first theme in E minor, that's number one, the second theme. However, you'll notice that we've changed key. We've gone to A flat. So we've gone from E minor, E here, E minor, up to, I mean, I guess, realistically, G sharp major, except that's not a real thing. So we've gone to A flat major, which is really, really unusual. And then the final um, little closing thing is in a different key as well. Uh, now, I am arguing that it's so unusual that it doesn't have a name. And also, if you remember Dvorak, he um, writes a thing called the New World Symphony. And people say that the Gaelic Symphony is incredibly similar to the New World Symphony, to the point where people might say almost that Amy Beach has copied the New World Symphony. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that's what people say. To the point where in the recapitulation of the New World Symphony, he Dvorak also goes from the E minor up to the A flat major. So that is quite similar, that's, and it's very unusual. Uh, for any music teachers out there, I've invented something because it doesn't have a name. If we went from C, instead of going down to A minor, we could go down to A flat, and that would be called a Neapolitan chord. So if it's inverted, right, we're going up, maybe it's called an inverted Neapolitan. I put it into chat GPT. Here it is, an inverted Neapolitan. Just ignore this bit here for a second. All right, moving on. Oh, then it has a coda. So again, this is not quite part of usual sonata form. It happens often, but we have a coda. Do we know what uh, bar this is at? Um, page 65 or O plus five. Said so the rehearsal mark O plus five. Uh, what's the melody in the coda? Uh, well, we have this melody, which comes from the fourth movement, uh, it sounds like this. It's quite fast. Oh my goodness. Nailed it. Some random terms that appear in this piece that you might not sure about. Here we've got allegro con fuco, which means fast with fire. Although it says it's fast with fire, but it starts pianissimo with tremolo, so really quiet and really low. So it doesn't actually sound like it's fiery and like Italian, but it kind of gets there. Uh, anyway, uh, the meter we would say is 6 8 or compound duple. Um, a cool little rhythm thing that happens. Uh, 
compound duple means the beat is divided into three. So then if you do something like this, where you put crotchets and it's in now sort of three, four, these crotchets almost sound like uh, a reverse triplet. So I've got an inverted Neapolitan and a reverse triplet. Just a fun little thing that happens throughout the piece. Uh, these little dashes here, that means play with tremolo, which is like a on the strings of the violins and every string, I guess. Uh, poku, meaning just a little, so a little bit of a crescendo through this part here. Then we turn the page over and then we have sempre, so consistently or more or like always. So this is do a big long consistent crescendo all the way through here. Uh, Pits means to play plucked on the string as opposed to using the bow. Arco means to play with the bow. Uh, Pew, little diminuendo, just a little bit. Uh, that sounded French, not um, Italian, sorry about that. Staccato, I hope you know what the staccato means by now. But these are the little dots in there. Play that short and detached. Look, tremolos, crescendos. Oh, did I do Sforzando? I'm not sure. Maybe that's coming up still. Hey, hey, Sforzando. Sudden force, strong accent. Uh, a little more tranquil. That's what this one means. Uh, poker rit. So do a little bit of a ritardando, a little bit of a slowdown in this part of the song. And then when you get here, go back to your original tempo. Dolce, in a singing style, sweetly. Oh no, sorry, it means sweetly, not in a singing style. That's cantable. Dolce means sweetly. Uh, oh, and then lastly, we do have some cadences in this piece, obviously, uh, but cadences actually aren't in the syllabus, so I'm not sure what to do about that, but you do have some like proper, perfect, authentic cadences and stuff like that happening. So it might be worth looking at, might not be. Compositional devices. Uh, just tried to find a few for you. I couldn't find them all, but here's some. Uh, this little sort of part here, this little, uh, what's it called? Like it's almost tritones or something. Uh, I saw augmented in the development. Uh, so if you just try and remember that, and then you can see that same thing is now done twice as long through this section near G. Uh, what else have I got for composition? Oh, there's some lovely sequences up the top here. What, are, what instrument are we playing? I'm not sure. Look at that. One, two, three. And again, one, two. Um, that's in the violins. There we go. So a lovely little sequence there at F. Good exam question. Changing keys, I presume. Are we? Oh, pressing the wrong buttons. A diminution means the shortening of the melody. Uh, and you kind of get that here with this second subject there, and then the end of the second subject is kind of shortened here. It's not a perfect example, I couldn't find a great example, but it's a little bit of an example of diminution. Uh, it's probably a, a more real world example. Uh, inversion is a tricky one because uh, if you can think about the original melody, the original melody kind of goes up a minor triad. It went um, B, E, G, which is just E minor triad. So anything then going down a triad is kind of an inversion of that melody a little bit. Um, so the, these these notes here are kind of an inversion. I gave it a shot. I don't know. Go look and hunt for your own compositional devices. Mm. Oh, what kind of exam questions might you get? Well, I cut and pasted these out of Scars as, um, what's it? Pretend exam. So you could have a look through some of these. Define the time signature. A great trick question. It's not asking you to put 6 8. It's saying put down compound duple, define it. Uh, the key, hopefully that's easy. You can remember that maybe. E minor. You should obviously try these questions and pause the video and all that kind of stuff, but no one's going to do that. You're just going to wait for me to do it. Uh, state where the second subject of the exposition commences. That would be a tricky question, especially if that's unseen analysis. Name the key of the second subject. Again, I hope you can remember. G major. The relationship between, oh, easy, relative, blah, 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 major. Unless it's in the recapitulation. Because <laughs> then it would be the inverted Neapolitan that I made up. 
Um, well, this one here would be a tricky question for this song because I actually don't know how that's done myself, but hey, what the heck, you could give it a go. Uh, what's on the next page? Uh, state the bar the recapitulation begins. I mean, that's a good question, but that would be a lot of score hunting for this one. So, yeah, good question. You could do that. Uh, how does that happen? That's a great one. So, recapitulation. So, one obvious one for this is the key has changed, and then you could go hunting around for some other ways it's uh, different. Uh, yeah. State the bar number where the second subject in the... Rep yep, good. Go find that thing again. Good work. Name the key of the second subject. Oh, we did that. A flat major. Inverted Neapolitan. I think I should get a hat that says Inverted Neapolitan. Hmm. Oh, no, it wasn't to be expected at all. Of course not, because De Vorjac. He was copied, stolen. I don't know. It's a good lesson there for your own compositions, right? Amy Beach, Gaelic Symphony, world famous. She kind of copied Dvork a lot. Dvork, Dvorjac. So in your own compositions, don't go too crazy trying to be too creative. Just copy some other people a little bit. All right, moving on. Um, okay, and lastly, this would be my last slide. Uh, a couple of things is, I really think you, if you want to answer any questions that pop up about identity, you really got to tie this sort of sentiment here to musical elements uh, or and this bit here. So somehow you've got to tie those two together in however the question is worded. Uh, and that's really it. Over here, that there is a picture that I got from an AI generated. It's not actually Amy Beach. So goodbye me. Uh, okay, hope this was helpful. Uh, put any corrections in the comments down below. I'll see you soon.